check the schedule, there's the little calendar thingy. This is the uh, uh, Russian literature or uh, some or uh, oh, here for a trumpet lesson. I'm sorry? I'm here for a trumpet lesson. <laughs> would you be shocked if somebody started speaking in Russian? Yes, I would. Da, I would. <laughs> and uh, you're here for a trumpet lesson. My God. No one wants to take trouble lesson with me. Um, this is uh, political blogging and constructing a solid blog post. I'm uh, David Manuel Davo at uh, the blog to political junkies. Uh, has anyone seen the blog? I know you have. And comments on it all the time. Two political junkies. Uh, dot blogspot. Dot com. No, the number two. So everyone can pull it up on their site and, or whatever. And uh, the camera is over there. So uh, if anyone, if anyone is actually on the site, I had this slide yesterday. I was watching the pit girl uh, thing. Um, if anyone is on the site and there are questions that come in from the internet from my one or two viewers, uh, just raise your hand if there's an interesting question. If it's uh, you know, boxes or briefs, I'll keep that one private. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, let's get started. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear. Okay. Uh, let me just start a little brief history of the blog. The uh, blog went live uh, sometime in 2004, September 2004. It's actually the second blog that my blog partner, Marie, and I were working on. Uh, we started at Hansberger as a liar, uh, which basically says it all. Um, and I'm going to try to just to let you know, I'm just going to try to keep what I'm saying here as kind of non political as possible. Uh, although, if you look at the blog, it's been two, three minutes on the blog, or obviously on the left. But I'm not here to indoctrinate anyone to the uh, uh, grand socialist cause. Uh, so, even though my examples are all kind of on the left, my guess is that. What I'm talking about can easily be used if you have an issue with a uh, liberal uh, columnist, you know, fact-checking a liberal columnist. Uh, how do you uh, uh, validate source material? That sort of thing. It should work in either direction. Uh, although all of my examples are pointed in one direction, I apologize in advance for that. Uh, the story was, it was um, early 2004, and I was, as they say, uh, in between employment opportunities. I met Maria. Uh, the other blogger at uh, the local Dean Volunteers uh, in 2003, uh, late 2003, summer 2003. So. And by January, with the, the famous Dean Scream stuff, the uh, Dean campaign had more or less uh, crashed and burned. Um, and I was home a lot watching a lot of TV. And one of the shows I was watching was uh, PCNC, local picture television, called Hunt, uh, Hunt Herder Live. And Fred Hunt Herder was on, and he had an hour long show. And uh, Maria told me that she called in a lot to argue with Fred and uh, to try to get a point across. And so I started calling in, became a regular caller. And we decided to try our hand at doing this blog thing of what Fred had talked about that day. We were blogging about it. Um, and at that point, I was rereading uh, Al Franken's book, The Lies and the Lying Liars that Tell Them. And I thought, if I can, you know, I had the whole internet at my fingertips, at my computer. So if I can do that, I certainly had a lot of time, certainly had the internet. Um, if I wanted to do that nationally, I'd be one of 10,000 people doing it. But if I wanted to do it locally, I might have some kind of an impact. So I started uh, with Fred. And uh, so Marie and I uh, went back and forth. We started this blog in, uh, I think, April or May of 2004. Um, and just as an early example of some fact checking, uh, here's something that, that I was able to do with Fred. And I, you know, I've met the guy, I've been on TV a couple times with him. He, he's a nice guy. He tests his politics, but he's a nice guy. And uh, so here's here's one of the here's one of the examples. Someone was calling in, this is April of 2004. Someone was calling in and complaining about the employment picture in the United States at the time. And Fred stopped it by saying, wait a second, one think of it this way, 1.4 jobs have been created by this economy since September. So I then kind of stopped the caller and I thought, that's got to be a big number, 1.4. There's a lot of minutes between September and uh, April. And so I took out a calculator and I thought, well, let me see what the, the exact number is, or at least close to the exact number. So this, this was April, so I thought, okay, you could be talking about April's employment numbers. It had to be up to March. So he said September to, to now. So it's, that was seven months. 
So I go, okay, seven months is about 210 days. So I tried, you know, I counted all the numbers. I gave Fred as much of benefit of the doubt as I could. And there's actually 212 days from September 1st to March, last day of March. Uh, is it 30 days or 30 first? 31st, okay. Uh, there's 212 days. It would normally be 211, but there was a leap year that year. So again, you fret the benefit of the doubt, which makes it uh, 5,008 hours or 305,280 minutes. So by Fred's own math, 1.4 jobs per minute, you multiply 305,280 minutes by 1.4, and you get about 427,392, which is still a large number, but that's spread out over seven months. Um, so when you start to look at economists saying, well, just by the population growth itself, you need to add about 140,000 jobs per month just to tread water. So here, here is Fred boasting about the good economy, uh, talking about how it's added 430, 427 and change thousand jobs in seven months. He's 80,000 jobs down per month. And I thought, well, the numbers were actually right, the numbers that were added, but he was spinning it in a way, thinking that no one was going to check his work. So that was one of the early blog posts that I did on, on Fred. He also even complicated things by adding that 360,000 jobs had been added in March alone. You go, okay, well, if it's 360,000 and you're up to 430,000, that's just 70,000 for the preceding six months. Once you start looking at the details and laying out the details, then it becomes a lot less pretty picture. That was a, that was an early blog post of, of Fred's. Another one, he was, um, that summer, um, Michael Moore comes out with Fahrenheit 9-11, uh, and the right was all up in arms. Uh, and so he was starting a segment about how even the liberal New York Times, I would debate as to whether the New York Times is liberal or conservative, that's not the point, but the liberal New York Times was saying that the movie was a bunch of crap. Um, so he starts reading, and I'm sitting next to the computer, and I'm sitting at the computer next to the TV, and I go, okay, well, you have the Google. Everyone has the Google. And if he's quoting someone, then you just put in quotation marks, run it through the Google, and find out where it's from. Turns out that what he was quoting was a column by David Brooks at the New York Times. So I go, okay, well, David Brooks is certainly going to be called liberal. I mean, he's a, you know. So again, bringing out the, the contextual details of something is, in a way, kind of to debunk um, a political pundit. And on the other hand, if you're going to do it yourself, you have to make sure that you don't make those mistakes because someone, someone in this room or someone in the next room on the right side of the building uh, who has just as much access to Google is going to slam you for it, and rightly so, because you're, you're putting things in, in the wrong context. So Huntsberger is a liar, kind of chugged on for a while. But Maria was interested in talking about uh, more national topics and less about what Fred was talking about that day. Uh, because sometimes Fred's show was, was a rerun, sometimes he was sick, sometimes you know it was just not interesting enough to, to do. So she started by September 2004, um, excuse me, the blog uh, Two Political Junkies. And she picked the number two because if you, she told me this later, uh, if you add the number, if you add the name to like a list that you alphabetize, the numbers always go on top. So if it was two as far as TWO, it would be way down at the bottom of the list with the T's and the everything else. If it was number two, it's way towards the top. And I realized, it took me about two, three years to realize that political junkies, the initial for political junkies also PJ. So we get listed in the local blogosphere as the two PJs. Uh, and I'm, I always wondered whether Murray was making a pun on the fact that you know, political bloggers, the ideas that we're sitting in the basement of our grandparents' house, you know, Cheeto dust. <laughs> In our pajamas or in our PJ, uh, but I actually haven't had the courage to uh, ask Maria that. Uh, but she's a lot smarter than I am, so uh, yeah, that's probably that's probably the case. Uh, so the interesting thing is that she formed the second blog to be a little more national uh, than just the local friend stuff. But as it's turned out, I tend to do a lot more national stuff, uh, national issues than she does. She does a lot of. Uh, local topics and local uh, advocacy. So that leads us to the next section of the thing, the different types of political blogging. And this is by no means a, uh, I just realized Bram isn't here. Who the hell is Bram? 
I thought he would be soaking this up. Oh well. Bram, in case you don't know, everyone knows Bram is? Uh, Bram Richbaum, he, he, <laughs> he writes at the uh, local uh, Pittsburgh blog, the uh, political, uh, Pittsburgh Common. It's a, it's a good blog. Um, I thought he'd be here because he does uh, political stuff as well. Um, but different types of political blog, uh, and this is by no means a complete list, but I, I tend to think of the stuff that I've seen as you've got blogs that are, you know, go to this rally, you know, donate this money to this cause, write to this congressman. And Marie does a lot of that, um, covering even covering events that are, uh, uh, you know, what what happened, you know, at this at this protest. Uh, whether you're there, whether you're just covering it by watching watching the news. Uh, I tend to not do that much of that stuff, which is not to say it's an invalid thing to do. I just don't do a lot of it. Um, what I tend to do, on the other hand, is kind of bring to most of my blog posts are attempts to bring to the surface some news news item that might not get played uh, much in the mainstream media or the front page of the Post-Gazette. Because uh, you got to remember, this is Pittsburgh. So if Ben Roethlisberger is constipated, yeah. that's above the fold front page of the, the uh, Post-Gazette. And yeah, well, I, well, I don't know how well the, you know, his diet is. Maybe they need to give him more brain um, So. Uh, so I mean, there there are focuses of the local news culture uh, that might not necessarily match mine. Which is not to say that I'm right and they're wrong. It's just you know we all have our own list of news reports and news topics that we like to see more of. And so the 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 my blogging stuff tends to be uh, stuff that I'm interested in and that I would want other people to see. Uh, I tend to focus on again on a lot of national things. Um, I try to keep track of some of the more uh, fringy aspects of the, uh, uh, of the of the right wing, just to see what the fringe is going through and uh, fringe is dealing with. Um, and I mean, it brings up an interesting, interesting philosophical point or quasi philosophical point. I mean, if you read any, I tend not to read that much, but if you read any uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, you don't have to necessarily agree, but there is the. The idea of kind of a news filter or filter going on, um, and I don't necessarily follow all of the details, but the kind of one of the core of his core of his idea is that you guys, you know, everyone that goes and buys a newspaper or watches a news program, you're thinking you are accessing the news, but he goes on to say that most of the money that comes into a news organization comes in by the advertising, so it's more likely that the advertising are advertisers are buying access to you rather than you buying access to the news. So there's a filtering process that goes on uh, and each news source has its own filters based on who owns the building, who pays the checks, who, you know, who pays the, uh, the writers. So I mean a certain amount of skepticism is necessary and if there's a limited number of news sources act, you know, readily accessible, uh, then it's then you know I've taken responsibility to try to raise to the surface just some things that I think uh, are important, which is not to say that you know I'm the final arbiter. If everyone were to do this, then everyone would be reading more news and getting more uh, more involved um, and be more more uh, informed. It just depends on which side of the aisle you're on. I mean, I've met a number of. Uh, folks on the conservative side who are complaining about the same thing that the news is a filter um, that you know you hear from, from conservatives it's the liberal uh, liberal media um, which is fine to have that discussion uh, I don't agree but that's that's certainly a, a worthwhile discussion and it's the same argument that um, it being a liberal media the topics that there are topics that aren't talked about uh, or topics that are downplayed and so if, say, you're on the right and you want to do exactly that, you sift through the news and go, well, this isn't being talked about, put it on your blog, and then maybe it'll spur, in a little, uh, spur on a little interest. Uh, it might not, but that's just the, the, chance you, the chance you have to take. Question, if I may? Yes. Did you say sift through the news? Can you talk about that? Well, um, I mean, do you use a news reader? Do you have particular sites that you go to? Well, I think everyone has their own, uh, everyone would have their own pantheon of news sources. Uh, I don't go through a news reader. I just, um, I check a number of news sites and 
sometimes I go through a meme random um, Google news, the, the Google news thing, you, add a you throw in a topic, search topic, uh, and whatever you're interested in. Obviously, one person can't get at everything, uh, and one news source can't produce everything. So you have to sift through various sources. Uh, I mean, if you're on the right, probably you're looking at, you know, a uh, national, national View Online, uh, Wall Street Journal, maybe the Washington Post, or Fox News, or uh, things like that. If you're on the left, you might be looking at the uh, you know, Times or the Washington Post or talk, uh, Talking Points Memo, uh, things like that. It, it is important to get a wide range so that you're erasing as much of each site or each individual filter as possible. There might be some little part of some little story that shows up in the McClatchy News Service that doesn't end up on the pages of the Washington Times or the Washington Post. That's what I mean by it. So essentially you're aggregating information. Yes, if I understand the word of aggregating. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you just go, I mean, it's kind of a thing in the morning or in the evening. Uh, I think we got fun. Um, you go out and you search through the news as best you can to look for uh, news topics and news sources that you're, that respond to the topic that you're looking for. Now, that does bring up an uh, interesting point. I'm going to get to it later, but I may as well touch on it now. How do you how do you evaluate differing news sources? Uh, I mean, for instance, the, the meat of the, the talk here is on, uh, say, debunking a political columnist that you don't necessarily agree with. How do you do it? Uh, it's not, I know Ed's done some of this. I've read, I've read some of his work. It's not enough to uh, just say, well, this is wrong. This is stupid. You're being stupid by saying this. Because it's just your opinion that it's wrong. And it's not enough, I mean, if you found a um, David Burt's column that you don't like, it's not enough to go, okay, well, you find a Thomas Friedman column that disagrees with the David Burt's column, and there you, you've done it. That's not enough, because you still have a kind of a he said, he said situation. Or if one of the people is more in doubt, it's a he said, she said situation. Uh, so what? how do you do it? Well, the point that what I tend to do, and if this were not a regular podcast, uh, thing. I'd be working on my Jack Kelly column, uh, which I do every Sunday Sunday morning. Uh, you have to kind of dive into the column and you know kind of shred it from the inside, in a sense. Um, uh, you, you have to dive in, uh, recognize the, the, the facts, recognize the content, the, uh, the structure of the thing, and try to invalidate it from the inside so that someone reads the column that you're debunking, someone reads your work, when they go back to the column, it's more or less useless. You're not invalidating it by just saying, well, I think it's wrong. 50,000 people think it's wrong. The majority of Americans think it's wrong. That's not really enough to do it. But in order to do that, you have to collect, marshal your own evidence. So what evidence can you find that isn't vulnerable to someone else's debunking, in a sense? Uh, where do you find readily accessible uh, and more or less bulletproof, to use a phrase, uh, information. You know, I, I would tend to think that um, nonprofit, non, not nonprofit, nonpartisan sources, uh, government in, uh, sources at the GAO, uh, if you're looking at employment numbers, Department of Labor, the employment numbers, um, if you're looking at something in science, National Science Foundation or National Science, whatever it is, uh, or NASA, or things like that. Some places it doesn't necessarily have its own political axe to grind. The more of an axe there is to grind, the more skeptical you can probably be. If there's a report out by, say, the Heritage Foundation, uh, you can pretty much go, well, they, they, they're pushing their point of view. Same thing with um, if there's a report out by the, the, uh, the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Uh, they are obviously got a point of view. And their facts may be correct. Uh, and they may be absolutely solid on what they're saying, but citing it is its own kind of has its own danger because it is a partisan push. Uh, it is a partisan. They, it, it has its own vulnerabilities that say finding the same information from a place that doesn't have an axe to grind, other than presenting as much information as possible, doesn't have. Uh, so where was I being uh, with this? Um, I'm sorry? Sources. Sources. Uh, and also, and this sounds, this is going to sound very, very strange. 
Um, but I also tend not to source other blogs as sources of information, uh, which is strange because I have a blog. And so I'm kind of invalidating my own point of view or my own position. Um, but it strikes me that part of the, the caricature of blogging and bloggers is that you can post anything um, that you want. And you, if you're citing other sources, if you're citing kind of fringe news sources, whether they are the, uh, uh, you know, the truthers, you know, a plane didn't hit the Pentagon <laughs> science, uh, or um, the Discovery Institute that, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, intelligent design science. You know, it, if you're citing that stuff as referencing and a blog cites, well, according to Dr. Smith, uh, Zachary Smith, of course, of the truther, I don't know if anyone got the joke. Yes, I'm lost. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I feel like a mummy now. Um, okay, uh, no one got the second joke. Um, so if you're citing blogs that are citing kind of fringe elements, then those have the same kind of vulnerabilities that you're trying to argue against when you present it with a, a pundit that is writing a column. Uh, so it has to be as solid as possible. And uh, taking a, a little a little walk from kind of um, uh, the science of encryption, uh, which is just a, a, an analogy, you should always assume if you're writing a blog post, and a political blog post that's doing all this stuff, that there's someone on the other side of the aisle, someone on the other side of the table who has smarter than you are, better writer than you are, uh, better access to Google, better researcher than you are, um, who will find the mistakes in your column the way you're trying to find the mistakes in someone else's column. Uh, so you have to kind of put your own analysis on what you're writing just in order to make sure that someone goes, wait a second, this is goofy, and then they'll slam you for it, and they'll slash you for it, because you're in the business of slashing political pundits. Uh, so you have to accept that if you make mistakes, someone is going to slash you, someone's going to crash and burn, someone's going to crush you into the dust. So do you like it if someone does that, or do you think you know it's Well, I try not to have it happen. Yeah. Well, well, try not to do things wrong, but it, it, would you rather have someone point it out and, and you're noticed, or not point it out at all? Um, uh, I'd rather actually have it not happen in the first place, so you have to be very careful. But if it gets pointed out, and if they're right, then you have to take your medicine. And uh, uh, here's an example. I'll get to this in a second. Here's an example. Um, I was uh, every now and then I tend to wander through Media Matters uh, to see what they have to say about the local uh, Queen and Rose show. And uh, just coincidentally, Maria, who is the other political junkie was on uh, Night Talk on Friday with Rose Tennant, who is the Rose of Quinn and Rose. Um, and they had they had a piece on Jim Quinn, I think equate to me, equating uh, welfare to slavery, uh, which I thought was pretty offensive. And so I misread the post that the Media Matters had, um, and I put something that Jim said into Rose's mouth. Uh, and I quoted her as saying what he had said. And she actually wasn't on the show uh, at that point. Uh, I was writing quickly, I was writing late at night, and I made a mistake. And she emailed to Maria, Maria sent me the email. And it was wrong, so you have to correct it. Um, you, know, you have to take your medicine and say, yes, this was a mistake, uh, and my bad, and whatever. Because if you don't, then you are making the same errors of, uh, of the people that you're trying to you know, crash and burn. Um, so that's that would be if it pointed out and it's right, then you take your medicine and you correct it. If you still think you're right, then you can argue it and make it another blog post and then continue the uh, continue the conversation. Uh, I tend not to uh, also comment on comments of my blog posts uh, only because I like to think that my final say of whatever the topic is is what I wrote in the first place. And if someone has an issue, then they'll point out an issue, and if, if it's right, I'll let it stand. Um, if not, then I'll stomp in and, and correct it. But I tend not to comment, because there's always a, you know, someone comments on you, you comment back, you're getting, inevitably, you'll only get about 85% of what they say, just by the limitations of, of language. Uh, and then there's always the, and another thing, you know, someone argues back, 
and then you argue back to them. You know, and then I was like, and you can spend all day or all week just going back and forth, and the news has changed. There's something else to, to write about. Um, Steve, Mr. Um, Hancock, what, what, your what I wanted to say is those people that find something wrong with you, if you can convert them to, you know, prize to first point out the defects in any article, or take people that are already supportive and say, uh, you missed this and we'll get this right, so you're not subject to just want to attack what and make well, it look stupid. Well, the, the, the yes, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, the people who tend to comment and disagree with me on the uh, uh, on the posts as blog, as uh, Ed can readily uh, say, they're never going to be convinced that I'm right. Uh, and they're never going to be convinced that they're wrong. We'll just stop talking and then go on to the next thing. Yes, Ed. Yeah. When I point out Ed, this is Ed. He writes a very good blog called Cognitive Business. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, some, some things, when you respond to commentaries, some things that you're responding to are, are in fact, ideology. And, you know, for example, if you talk about economic things, and you're saying, well, you know, feel that the stimulus has, has done some things, but it was, you know, it didn't work well because it was skewed partially to tax credits or something along that line. And then you get into the sort of the, well, do tax credits work? Do they not? And you're, you know, into economic ideology. And that's um, more. Complicated, so that's where it's harder to use facts. Yeah, you, know, you can bring up Keynes or Friedman or whoever, um, probably much better. Or Louis, you know, well, <laughs> Lindy or not. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I'm just saying, you know, that you, you, you certainly, you know, there, there's something you definitely can't resolve. That's true. That's true. Um, I tend to think of it uh, presented as as you playing speed chess. Um, you know, you got to go in, you got to make your point, you got to make your point quickly. And then get out because uh, you know I don't make any money off the blog. I have to go to work, you know. So I'm blogging, you know, 5:30 in the morning to when I leave about 7, 7:30. So you just gotta boom, make your point, and then and then leave. And you're not gonna be able to convert anybody or everybody. Uh, you just continue the uh, continue the conversation. Um, the uh, uh, I wanted to get into a little about what a column is, and again, this is just my my idea of how to conceive of a column in order to try to invalidate. Uh, I tend to picture it as a kind of a structure, like like this building, uh, although a lot less complicated than this building, um, uh, a box or a structure or an architecture or a fabric. And without getting too Aristotelian, there is the form and then the content. The content might be the facts that are being used, and the form would be the logic or the rhetorical devices. Uh, so if you're going out into the world and wanting to be a political blogger or a political debunking political blogger, uh, it might be important to, might be a good idea to crack open a book on uh, on logic. A uh, good book is Peter Kreeft, K-R-E-E-F-T, a book called Socratic Logic. It's expensive, so get it on eBay or get it on the library or something. Uh, and what he does, he he talked about everything up until kind of modern logic, you know, the, all the symbolic logic with the P's and the Q's and the upside down U's and stuff. And goes into just the rhetorical devices of classical logic and spends a lot of time on um, uh, logical fallacies. And for, for instance, one of the, the, I guess, more famous logical fallacies showed up in an episode of uh, West Wing, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, that two things, if they're connected, one happens before the other. You can't assume that the first thing made the second one occur or had anything to do with the second one. They could both be results of a another source or they could both be a coincidence. Uh, you've got the logical fallacies of uh, you know, comparing apples and oranges, you know, apples and oranges conversation. Uh, I had a Jerry Boyer column that I did that a number of uh, weeks ago. He was he was trying to assert trying to assert that we shouldn't be complaining about the healthcare system. Granted, there are many ways, many reasons to compare it. You complain about the healthcare system or not. But what he was doing was he was saying that Americans are now living longer than ever, so therefore shouldn't complain about healthcare. Um, I mean, there are many, as I said, many reasons to complain, complain about healthcare. Uh, it's too expensive or it's not efficient or on either side of the aisle. I'm not trying to push any political ideology here. But his argument was invalid because. The two things didn't have anything to do with each other. I mean, you can conceive of a, um, uh, a country out in the middle of nowhere has very bad health care. Someone, you know, pops open a uh, hospital 
for the million people in the country. And then the healthcare gets better, but or the, the life expectancy gets better, but it's still lousy. It's a, you know, so he really was pointing in two different directions. So that would also be another logical fallacy. By working your way through the book, or uh, this book, uh, Web of Belief, uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, who is a, a philosopher of Um uh, This is a good book. Or uh, there's probably a thousand others, uh, most of which I've never even heard of. Um, you get an idea of, you know, kind of smoking out logical inconsistencies in a column. And so as you're putting pressure on the inconsistency and pointing out the inconsistency, then someone reading the column after you've pointed out the inconsistency, boom, the column, the column fails. Um, or if what is cited as facts aren't actually as factual as the columnists would like to think. Uh, which leads to another kind of epistemological question. What constitutes a fact that is undeniable? You know, we got into this a little bit uh, source source work. Um, for instance, the, the early thing of, of um, uh, Fred's thing about the 1.4 jobs per minute, that was certainly a fact. And it was certainly undeniable because the numbers were at the uh, Department of Labor. But within the context of what it was, it actually was incorrect. Uh, it wasn't saying what Fred was saying it was saying, which is another kind of, I don't know how to put it. Um, for instance, if, if in a Jack Kelly column he cites a report, this report from the UN says X, Y, Z. And you actually go to the report and you read it and the next sentence down is, Oh, they're, they're very good examples, actually, of uh, uh, folks complaining uh, global warming. Uh, there's this report from this scientist that says uh, temperatures have been stabilizing, so therefore we can assume that global warming doesn't exist. You go to the source, next paragraph down, the, the scientists are saying, this does not say that global warming does not exist. <laughs> and so pointing that out, again, someone reading your work, your analysis of the column, they go back to the column and they go, yeah, but that's exactly, that's not really what the scientist said. So the columnist is misquoting what the scientist said. Presenting that, again, you're slashing, you're, you're invalidating, uh, you're, you're invalidating enough of the structure that someone reading it later, it collapses. It's not enough to just, well, it's wrong. Are you showing why it's inconsistent, or why it's not factual, or why it's illogical? So if someone else approaching the thing afterwards is, well, this is this is just words that you know they may as well be random. You know the, the, the chimpanzees typing on the uh, on the typewriter. Uh, I wanted to get into see if we have time. Um, I wanted to get into a uh, uh, case in point. Actually, a couple cases in point. A couple articles that I that I uh, again Jack Kelly. Jack Kelly is a uh, political columnist at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. He's one of the two or three, might be just two conservative columnists there. The other being uh, Ruth Ann Daly, who's also a very nice woman. Uh, I met her a couple times. Very sweet. Uh, sometimes she's just out to lunch, but that doesn't make her very sweet. Uh, Jack, on the other hand, has a weekly column. He used to, or he used to be the listed as the national security correspondent. Um, and I think they've since to stop, stop describing him as that because he spent a lot of time writing just straight, straight ahead political columns. You know, well, why is a column on Sarah Palin something that's national security? You know, not not to invalidate him if he wants to write on Sarah Palin, that's fine, but it's not a national security. So he had a column recently in September about the uh, now resigned White House staffer a guy named Van Jones. I'm sure everyone's followed the story uh, a little. Um, he was up, it was some kind of green jobs uh, czar uh, uh, thing going on. And so, luckily, what happens with the post is it's a little secret about the Jack Kelly stuff. Uh, he's also a columnist for the Toledo Plate, which is the sister paper of Pittsburgh Post Gazette. And his columns show up on the Toledo Plate on Saturday. So, every Saturday afternoon, I get a uh, head start on Jack's column by checking out the website at the Toledo Blade. And he had a column on Van Jones, where the point of the column seemed to be um, uh, asking a rhetorical question, how much influence, how much pressure the White House put on the Secret Service to let Van Jones into the White House? Because if you look at his history, his history is filled with, um, you know, he was arrested, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so how much pressure 
did this, the Obama White House put on the Secret Service to allow Van Jones in. You go, okay, well, when you look at the history that as presented by Jack, it just collapsed when under the, the guise of like looking for facts. For instance, uh, Jack pointed out that uh, Mr. Jones was arrested in 92 in the, uh, uh, during the Rodney King riots. Uh, when you actually look at his biography, he wasn't arrested in 92 in the, 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 uh, uh, the riots in LA. He was arrested a week later in San Francisco. San Francisco, I guess, had a curfew. Um, and so for that week, nothing could happen. Right after as the curfew was listed, li listed, lifted, uh, there was a demonstration. He was sent out as a uh, legal uh, observer, demonstration observer. Like if anyone saw any of the, or if anyone was at, I feel sorry to the uh, the G20 uh, protests, we're going to get tear gas too much. But there were legal observers from the ACLU that probably had an orange hat on or a yellow hat with a, with a name tag. My well, he got arrested. He was a legal observer. Well, that's what happened to Van Jones in San Francisco. Uh, the police just scooped up everybody in the area, arrested them all, and he was released a couple hours later. He sued, he and a group of other people, or he attached himself to a group that sued the San Francisco uh, police, and they won. So you go, okay, these are the facts, comes from multiple sources, and then you go, okay, this is what Jack wrote about it. You go, well, Jack's obviously wrong. Uh, he pointed out that Van Jones was arrested in the in a WTO, um, uh, protest in uh, Seattle. The only source of that is some of the uh, more colorful speech of uh, Glenn Beck. Couldn't find it anywhere else on, on the web. Someone, if, I mean, these things are public knowledge. If it were someplace, someone would have pointed it out. So those two things get taken off the table. And everything else that, that Jack was complaining about were all political considerations. Uh, Van Jones called himself a communist. Okay. Well, is, is it being a communist enough to invalidate your entry into the White House? <laughs> so just pointing out all of this stuff, uh, I did my, I did my, my writing on it uh, Sunday morning, um, and uh, by Wednesday, the Post Gazette yanked the column off the website. <laughs> it's still at the Toledo Blade website, as far as I know, uh, but it's not, at the, it's not in his uh, biography, it's not in his archive, it's not anywhere. They just pulled the whole thing. And my understanding from the, uh, the inside of the building was that it got pulled because it had more than Jack's usual number of errors, um, which I'm, I'm very happy to point out to the, uh, the uh, good writers, the uh, good editors of the, the Post Gazette. Uh, he also had another column on, uh, or actually we have five minutes left, so I may as well open the thing up to uh, some questions. If anyone has, yes, yes, and you just get one question, because okay. you know, everyone pointed to you out. I already gave you advertising for your blog. Um, so what's, what's your stand, or, or maybe explain your stand on anonymous commenters? The pros, the cons? Uh, we used to have anonymous commenters. Um, and we've since, uh, we've since ratcheted up the security so that you have to have like a Google account or some kind of verifiable account uh, to comment. Only because there were, there were a number of commenters who would comment anonymously. Uh, saying just awful, awful stuff that you could spend all day just disagreeing with. Uh, there was a commenter that I actually ended up shutting down the comments for the blog for a couple weeks because he was making the case that uh, Obama was selling or had sold cocaine to his own daughters. And he goes, I can start swearing that and I say, okay, this is enough. This is enough. I, I just got to let things cool off. I, I locked the door and moderated the comments for a little while. And I think the, the commenter, uh, 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 I think he has since stopped commenting. Although he made, he made a tactical error by gloating to me in an email, uh, which was sent from his home address, his home email address. So it took a, just a little bit of time to, I got his name, then you run it through Google, run it through news servers, and he was a guy who was head of the a local Republican committee in some local town. And so I wrote him back and said, you know, I'm not going to use this information, but this was a stupid thing to do. Because, you know, so anyone else could just go, well, this is blah, 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 and, you know, uh, do, do some really, really awful stuff. And he since uh, stopped blogging. Um, I mean, I tend to think, it's, it's hard to say this. My first blog, the uh, Huntsburg the Liar, we did that under pseudonyms. So we really can't uh, poop on the idea of anonymous or you know, commenting uh, with a student because that's where we started. 
So we, we Marie and I just um, balanced on the thing of, you know, you have to have a Google account that can trace back to something else. Uh, and we've got a couple of, of uh, very fervent uh, disagreeers. Um, one is uh, heir to the throne. I don't really know anyone. I think he's got a local blog. He, he actually signed out when Steely McBean hit the town. Uh, he signed out like steelymcbean.blogspot.com like that afternoon. I thought, okay, this is cool. Um, and uh, there's another, another local guy with the name. But you know, they can always be uh, counted on to, uh, to disagree and have some fun. And, and so. uh, I'll go here because you're going to get to the next one. Uh, I guess you, you mentioned a few times that you don't get paid for this, and I think a lot of us in the room that are blogging don't get paid for this. And uh, we often get the question, why do you do it, and you know, what do you hope to get out of it? So what's your answer to that? Uh, well, I, I have to I have to correct things. We do get paid a little. Our our uh, uh, our content gets run through a company called News Text, and they send us a check when the check you know they they charge for people looking at the, the content. And we get a check whenever the check is more than $25. And I think we get a check for about 26 every four months. Uh, so I just take one and send the other to Maria to buy cigarettes and stuff. Uh, why do I do it? I do it because someone has to talk back. Um, uh, and this might get a little lefty. Uh, I mean, for instance, take the Jack Kelly column. If you really, really disagree with what he writes. Or if you're on the right and you really, really, really disagree with, say, Tony Norman or uh, Brian O'Neill or whatever, just local writers, uh, and you write a really good letter to the editor. Now, the Post-Gazette has a, has, a, uh, uh, has a rule that you can't have a letter to the editor published more than, like, once every three months. So if you just, you know, you think Brian O'Neill is the biggest pile of poop ever, and you just slaughter a column and get it into the paper, you can't write in the paper for another three months. He's got another column the next week. So if you blog on it and do exactly the same stuff there, then uh, but then you want the the uh, search engines will pick up your your uh, your content and if someone else who is neutral or whatever goes on. Look what Brian Neal Brian O'Neill has to say about drug testing or about this or that the other thing is something that you disagree with. They will find his column and then your column. I mean, if you, if you I think, do a Google search on Jack Kelly in Pittsburgh, somewhere on the front front screen of Google is two political junkies. Um, my Jack Kelly columns are, are, are called Jack Kelly Sunday uh, every week. Uh, they, it, and it just got to be a point where it got too much work to come up with a new title for every Sunday, so I just call them Jack Kelly Sunday. So it's, it's a way to talk back. It's a way to hold um, the the political columnists, their feet to the fire. Make sure that, you know, it's not a matter of me wanting Jack to get fired. Uh, because it's necessary to have competing, I mean, in a democracy, it's necessary to have, and it's a good idea to have competing ideas in the marketplace. But if someone is using their place in the marketplace to uh, uh, have present facts that aren't completely factual, or uh, a, a, a column that isn't completely logical, but there's a Conclusion. Someone has to go, um, no, that's not the case, and here's why. And then it's on the internet, it's on the internet forever. Yes? You, two, two quick. Okay. Did you say news test or news task? Uh, neither. News text. News I think it's text. news text or news test. I think. Okay. Uh, the, the other question, the real question is with Blogspot, how do you screen? For a reliable email address source, all that. How do you do that? Um, I don't think we do. It's just it's it's a security thing in the template in Blogspot that only people with Google accounts uh, can comment because you have to you know in the, the comment uh, section you both add you know add a comment or whatever um, you have the, the box that you type your comment in. And then there's the security thing to, to try to fight against the, the box or response. And then there is the you have to have a Google account or one of four or five other accounts. And we need to so there's that. a secure I, because I didn't see that. Yeah, it should it should be in the Is there? Yeah, it's in the setting. Okay, I'm not saying this one. Yes, it's in the setting. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to know I have trouble. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the higher the higher setting would be um, moderating the comments. Um, I think uh, Agent Ska, last time I checked, who's another local blogger, uh, she moderates the comments. So if you send something in, she has to okay. No, no, being new to this, if there's a comment you don't want it to stay, you can make it go. I can make it go, but we I don't think we've done that more than a handful of times. If um, like if you were to write something and say, and I apologize for the, uh, I wonder if I could delete. If you were to write something and say, you know, I'm going to kill you, you bastard. I'll delete that. Uh, but if you say, if you were to say, um, I'd like to. That, even that, I think I think we probably delete right. that. Yeah. If you were to say, you know, um, uh, President Obama is is the usurper. He was uh, he's actually uh, born in Kenya, uh, and he has no right to be the president. That stays because it's not anything that is you know threatening or if if you know use any of George Carlin's seven thirty words. We might. Uh, delete you on that, but I don't think so because Maria uses a lot of those words. <laughs> so I, I can't really say that we would delete someone for using any of those words when she uses so many. I use none. I tend to be uh, very clean in my, in my thing. Any other? Yes? How do you balance? I mean, it seems to use a lot of official sources, you know, newspapers and whatnot. How do you balance like the official position, you know, whether it's right or left official positions, with kind of like, the third types of, um, you know, of views well, on the story? That's always a very delicate dance because um, there always is the official position, and then there is kind of mainstream media take on it. Um, I, I just tend to put enough faith in the fact that there are enough competing mainstream media points of view that. Looking through more than one of them, you'll catch an idea of um, what the truth is, rather than uh, you know shouldn't believe. I mean, the, the uh, uh, press secretary, whoever uh, the guy's name is, uh, her press, you know, he says something that doesn't mean it should be taken as gospel, uh, or even someone writing about something that he says. But you just have to sit through multiple news sources and come up with what you're uh, comfortable with. Uh, and then you also have to think of, well, if you were wrong, or if the position that the current position is wrong, what would have to be in place for it to be wrong? If that ends up being a more complicated story than what's being presented, then you can pretty much assume what's being presented is at least closer to the truth than what is contrary, if that makes any sense. I guess, I don't know, I come from like not liking either party, so I come from saying, like, okay, Fox News, I don't care about other stuff. Mainstream, just you know, regular news I don't really care for. So I'm looking for like a lot of the both of their facts seem sometimes based on facts that spun like two different ways. Well, yes, yeah. I mean, there, there is always spin. Uh, I remember seeing the, the, uh, the movie uh, The Truman Show, I don't know if anyone's <laughs> seen it. And the thought that occurred to me when Truman finally meets his father on the uh, bridge and it's raining, and the assistant director's going, okay, we should fade out now. And the director, uh, and and something about Ed Harris. Ed Harris. Um, uh, he goes, no, 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 raise the music, raise the music. Okay, and, and it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, every television should have this sign on top of it saying, you are being manipulated. Whenever you're watching <laughs> the news, whenever you're watching the drama, whenever you're watching commercials. So you have to have that idea in your head and look at what someone else views the same thing as the same manipulation. Because 10 people looking at the same manipulation somehow something is going to filter through and it'll be closer than whatever you'd be manipulated to. The, the, the right word, I'm not sure. You're saying manipulations cancel out? No, different manipulations can cancel each other out. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to spin from the left, trying to spin from the right, uh, viewing both, somehow you're not seeing the same manipulation. So somehow you got to find your way through the both. Into some place that you're comfortable with. You might not be agreeing with anybody. But uh, as long as it can be solid and it can be justified, it can be verified, then that's the way it is. Uh, yeah. Another question, yes? I think Fox News proves some people have to be manipulated by the people with the same character. How uh, is that all of this stuff? Well, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs>